The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our webinar, the new EU Radio Equipment Directive webinar. Thank you for joining us. This webinar is being given by MET Laboratories. MET is a leader in the testing of electrical and electronic equipment for environmental hardiness, product safety, and electromagnetic compatibility. MET operates world-class labs in Baltimore, Maryland, Santa Clara in Union City, California, Austin, Texas, and also runs operations in China, Taiwan, and Korea. This webinar will run 30 to 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes for questions and answers. Due to the number of registrants, all attendees will have their phones muted. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel. We will attempt to answer all questions at the end. Just a quick note on some other upcoming events. We are having a Wi-Fi product Sip and Learn in Santa Clara, California tomorrow and a 60601-1-2 fourth edition medical EMC webinar on the 24th of May and you can go online to get more information and register. Today's webinar is being presented by Dusmanta Tenakun. Dusmanta is our wireless lab manager and at this point I will hand over the presentation to Dusmanta. Thank you, sir. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the uh, presentation uh, for the Radio Equipment Directive. Uh, my name is Desmanda Tenekun. I'm the wireless lab manager here in Baltimore. Uh, I also do reviews for STC Canada and also a, a notified body reviewer under the RNTT Directive. Uh, so today's presentation will be on the uh, new radio equipment directive, uh, which will take effect uh, in a couple of days. The agenda for the presentation uh, will be, first of all, a brief introduction to the uh, radio equipment directive. Uh, throughout, throughout the slides, I'll be uh, referring to the directive as, as the RED or the radio equipment directive. Uh, they all mean the same thing. Uh, I will go over the scope of the uh, Radio Equipment Directive, uh, what's new under this new directive, uh, what are some of the manufacturer responsibilities, and uh, labeling of the equipment, and also some conformity ass assessment procedures under the Radio Equipment Directive. Uh, the Radio Equipment Directive was first published in the uh, European Union Official Journal back in May 22 of 2014. Uh, this new Radio Equipment Directive replaces the uh, Radio and, uh, and Telecommunications Terminal Equipment Directive. Uh, the new Radio Equipment Directive is also known as the 2014-53-EU. Uh, the, the RED uh, came about because of some of the shortcomings under the RNTT directive, uh, and the shortcomings uh, led to the uh, compilation of the uh, radio equipment directive. So, under the new radio equipment directive, um, there are uh, different uh, categories of equipment that will fall under it. Uh, the scope will include radio communication and also radio determination equipment. Uh, radio receivers, such as sound and TV broadcast receivers, are in the scope. Uh, safety of animals and property are also in the scope. Uh, equipment operating below 9 kilohertz is also under the scope, under the uh, red. Uh, if you uh, recall under the RNTTE, uh, any device, a radio device, that had a transmit frequency of less than 9 kilohertz did not fall under the RNTT directive. It fell under either ENC directive, low voltage directive, or some other directive. But under the radio equipment directive, even devices operating below 9 kilohertz will be included. So as you can imagine, there will be a category of, there will be a whole bunch of uh, equipment that will be transitioning into the red uh, from other directives. Uh, radio devices operating below 3,000 gigahertz will be included. So what's not in the radio equipment directive? 
network terminal equipment such as fax machines will not be in the uh, radio equipment directive. Those will fall off into the ENC and the low voltage directive. Parts destined for commercial or military aircraft will not be in the red, and it was the same case for RTT directive. They were not uh, under those uh, directives. Custom built evaluation kits uh, destined for pro professionals uh, to be used solely at research and developmental facilities uh, will not be in red. Equipment used by amateur radio operators and ISM equipment not used for communications uh, such as microwaves uh, will not be uh, in scope. So under the RNTT directive ceases to provide assumption of conformity after June 12, 2016. So after that date, you have to meet the requirements of the Radio Equipment Directive. But the uh, European Commission has given a one-year transition period for existing products until June 12, 2017. So if a new radio product is placed on the market during that transition period, you can meet the RED or the RNTT directive, and it is completely up to the manufacturer. So here's a couple of transition uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, before June 13, 2016, uh, RED shall not be used, and therefore a manufacturer cannot draw up a declaration of conformity document referencing the uh, new equipment directive. So a declaration of conformity is a document that the manufacturer puts together on their own, saying here's how we meet the directive, here's all the testing that we have done, and we uh, declare on our own that it meets all the requirements of the directive. So the declaration of conformity has to be submitted with your uh, SKUs, your equipment, before it gets uh, shipped to Europe. So before June 13, 2016, a manufacturer should not reference the radio equipment directive. It still needs to reference the RNTT directive. Now for notified bodies, uh, they shall not issue a, uh, an, a notified body opinion under the radio equipment directive. So before June 13, 2016, all the opinions should reference the older directive. Now, a notified body uh, issuing a opinion under the INTT directive will ideally have a comment in the uh, in the type certificate stating that the opinion will expire either on June 2017 or June 2016. So, uh, June 2016 is there. Uh, for devices that fell under the RNTT directive, uh, such as fax machines. Now they're going to drop out of the uh, radio equipment directive into the EMC and low voltage directive. So they have to meet the new EMC directive or the low voltage directive as of June 2016. Uh, other devices that fall under red can still uh, continue to use the opinion under the RNTT directive. So uh, I'm going to highlight three categories of equipment, uh, uh, three t transitional cases. Uh, so the first one is radio equipment currently in the scope of the red. So if you have a, let's say, a Bluetooth device under the RTT directive, uh, obviously it's going to fall under the radio equipment directive as well. So those sort of devices have until June 13th. 2017 to use the current declaration of conformity under the older directive. So after this date, a new declaration of conformity under the red must be drawn up. So you have you can take advantage of that one year transition period. Then the second category is equipment moving out of the EMC directive and low voltage directive into the red. So radio and TV broadcast receivers 
were not under the RNTT directive, they were under the EMC directive. So now those will be moving into the radio equipment directive. Another uh, example is transmitters and receivers that operate below 9 kilohertz. So under the RNTT directive, those were not in scope, but under the radio equipment directive, they will be in scope. So they're going to they're be moving into the radio equipment directive. So these devices can also continue to be sold until June 13, 2017. The third category is equipment moving out of the RTT directive and into the EMC and the low voltage directive. Uh, equipment such as telephones, fax machine, machines, wired routers, they all will fall out of the radio directive and fall out of the EMC or and the low voltage directive. So these need to meet the EMC and the low voltage directive by June 13, 2016, which is coming up pretty fast. The new EMC directive and the low voltage directive took effect April 20th, 2016. So, um, as I mentioned previously, uh, a couple of slides ago, uh, the radio equipment uh, directive was a consequence of, uh, of the RNTT not uh, being ambiguous in certain areas. One of them was who the responsible party is. So the radio equipment directive uh, clearly states that the responsible party is the manufacturer. It states the manufacturer having detailed knowledge of the design and production process is best placed to carry out the conformity assessment procedure. Conformity assessment should therefore remain solely the obligation of the manufacturer. So in no uncertain terms, uh, it clearly states that the manufacturer bears all responsibility. So just like under the RTT directive, the radio equipment directive has the same essential requirements with some added ones as well. Uh, the first one, Article 3.1, is that radio equipment shall be constructed so as to ensure the protection of health and safety of persons and of domestic animals and the protection of property. So not only does it care about humans, but it also cares about animals and also property. So one could uh, use, uh, ideally use the new low voltage directive or you could do RF exposure evaluation uh, to meet some of those uh, aspects of 3.1. Uh, 3.1b is the adequate level of electromagnetic compatibility as set out in Directive uh, 2014-30EU, which is the new EMC directive. Uh, so basically your digital emissions is uh, what they refer to there. So if you had a radio device, let's say a Bluetooth, uh, you would also need to look at the uh, uh, digital emissions, basically the standard you would use uh, most often is the EN301489 set of standards. Article 3.2 of the essential requirements is basically radio equipment shall be so constructed that it both effectively uses and supports the efficient use of radio spectrum in order to avoid the harmful interference. So those are all your radio standards. Uh, going back to the example of a, a Bluetooth, uh, the most commonly used standard is EN300-328, uh, which is a radio standard. So the European Union uh, publishes harmonized standards, so any one of those radio harmonized standards can be used to meet Article 3.2. Article 3.3 is radio equipment with certain categories or classes shall be so constructed that it complies with the following essential requirements. Radio equipment interworks with accessories in particular with common charges. So one of the problems we have is that every time you switch your cell phone, you have to go out and uh, find another charger. So uh, one of the, the requirements that a European member state might uh, state is that you have to have 
uh, interoperability between charges and cell phones. That, that, so that is something that a member state reserves the right to do is uh, implement a uh, or delegate an act where they uh, specify that charges have to be interoperable with cell phones. So we're going to talk about some of the manufacturer obligations. Under the RNTTE directive, if you had a device, it was a radio, you had it tested, uh, you put the CE label, and if you knew that some countries did not uh, have that channel plan, you would put the alert mark next to the CE label indicating to someone that this product may not be used in all member states. Uh, under the radio current directive, the alert mark is going away. Uh, you are not supposed to put that on the label, but instead, the manufacturer, who is the responsible party, must first make sure that before they send a piece of equipment to a member state in Europe, they have to verify that the frequency and the power that the radio will use is harmonized in that country. So the website listed here is a place where somebody can go and they can look up the country and and see what the, the frequency ranges are. So if you had a Bluetooth device uh, in North America and in most uh, European member states, uh, the 2.4 frequency band in its entirety can be used. So 2.402 gigahertz to 2480 gigahertz is uh, the common frequency uh, band that is used. So somebody can search uh, on, in that website just to make sure that the country that you're going into does allow you to use the full band. And there are some instances, some countries in Europe where they do not have that full band available uh, for a device like Bluetooth. So it is up to them to make sure to go to that website or any other place that they can find uh, legitimate um, information about the uh, transmitter parameters into a country they want to go into. So to meet the essential requirements 3.1a or 3.1b, uh, if you recall 3.1a is the safety of humans, animals, or property. 3.1b is the EMC requirements. Uh, so a manufacturer may demonstrate compliance either by applying harmonized standards or by other means. And we'll talk about other means uh, in the next couple of slides. You do not need to go through a notified body for 3.1a and 3.1b. Uh, for 3.2, 3.2 is the uh, efficient use of the radio spectrum. A notified body shall be used if harmonized standards are not used or they are partially used. And then after the testing is done, you need to draw up a uh, technical documentation to show compliance to the directive, uh, which we talked about, which is the declaration of conformity. So a uh, declaration of conformity shall be drawn up by a manufacturer in a language appropriate for the member states. So not all member states in Europe, uh, not all of those countries, uh, English is not their uh, official language. So if you happen to send it to a country where English is not the official language, then the declaration of conformity needs to be in that language. Now a declaration of conformity is a, you know, it could be a two, three page document where you list all the testing that you've done, all the standards that you've been tested to, uh, and you self-declare that you meet the requirements of the directive. Now if you did not want to do that, uh, you can have a, what's known as a a simplified declaration of conformity where basically all it's saying is uh, the declaration of conformity can be found at this URL and you basically list the URL. So somebody could go to that URL and then there you'll have the declaration of conformity. Uh, you could choose to do it either way. Uh, some manufacturers find it easier just to list the URL uh, and that, that way they can have it updated routinely uh, rather than have to uh, ship out uh, additional paperwork. Then the CE mark needs to be placed on the device uh, before it enters Europe. 
Uh, E-labeling is allowed for devices that have a screen. So a cell phone uh, that has an integrated screen, can uh, you can choose to have E-labeling. The technical documentation, meaning the reports or any other document, the DOC needs to be kept on file for at least 10 years after the radio equipment has been placed on the market. Uh, if a CE mark is placed, it shall be capable of operating in at least one member state. So why is that statement there? So uh, a lot of countries outside of Europe uh, also uh, they do recognize the CE marks, meaning if a product has been tested to European standards, it has a CE mark, uh, that country will ex uh, ex accept for the most part those test reports uh, and the declaration conformity bearing and the device bearing the CE mark. Now, there were manufacturers in the past where even though the frequencies used in that particular country did not match any of the European countries, they still placed the CE mark uh, just because it was recognized. So now the radio equipment directive is stating that you should not use the CE mark on a product if it's not capable of operating in at least one of the member states, which makes sense. So manufacturers shall ensure that procedures are in place for series production to remain in conformity with the directive. Changes in radio equipment design or characteristics and changes in the harmonized standards or in other technical specifications by reference to which conformity of radio equipment is declared shall be adequately taken into account. So what that means is that you as a manufacturer need to continuously uh, uh, monitor the standards and the regulations in Europe and need to stay abreast of it. So if a standard changes that applies to your product, then you need to test to the latest version of that standard so that you can continuously update your declaration conformity. A great example in point was uh, EN 30328. Uh, a couple of years ago, the version number was 171. When 181 came, there was a drastic change in the requirement. Uh, so everybody needed to update their uh, testing to include the new requirements on the new version of the standard, and then after that was successfully completed, they needed to go back and update the declaration of conformity to reference the newer version of the standard. So the declaration of conformity is not a one-time deal. It is a living, breathing document that needs to be continuously updated when change of standards and rules and regulations change. So uh, a, a departure from the radio equipment directive, uh, under the new directive, the radio device needs to bear a type, batch, or serial number or other element allowing it to be identified. So if the device is too small, this can go on the packaging or the user manual as well. So that's there so that if market surveillance authorities pick up one of these products on the market and they find it is not in compliance, to the radio equipment directive, there's a way for them to contact the manufacturer and then the manufacturer has a way to uh, go back and see uh, where, uh, what location, what batch or serial numbers did this particular unit come from and thereby either uh, holding up production or um, doing whatever is necessary to make sure that that batch or serial numbers do not make it to the market until a remedy is identified. So the labeling or, or the other documents that provided for the uh, device needs to have some sort of way so that the manufacturer can easily go back and identify during what time was this device manufactured, where was it manufactured, and other identifying information easily. The device also needs to show the manufacturer name trade name or registered trademark, and the postal address at which they can be contacted. And again, this information can go on the packaging or the user manual if the device is too small. And again, this is in place so that market authorities can easily track down the manufacturer. 
The manufacturer shall ensure that the radio equipment is accompanied by instructions and safety information in language which can be easily understood, uh, which we mentioned uh, a couple of slides to go. It needs to be in a language uh, that the uh, device is going into. So the user manual at least needs to uh, have the following information. It needs to list the frequency bands in which the device operates. It also needs to list the maximum RF power transmitted uh, when operating those frequency bands. Under the RITT directive, uh, there was no requirement to have the frequency bands or the RF power output in the user manual. But now under the radio equipment directive, it's been mandated. So again, again, it's, uh, it's for, uh, for consumers and for market authorities so that they know what the product is, what frequencies they operate, what RF power levels they operate on. Manufacturers shall ensure that each item of the radio equipment is accompanied by a EU declaration conformity or by a simplified EU declaration conformity. And if you choose to have a simplified DOC, uh, you need to have the URL of where the full conformity or the full uh, declaration conformity can be found at. And again, a manufacturer's responsibility is to make sure that they comply with all the requirements, regulations uh, as they go along. And if there's any changes to it, they need to take immediate action to bring the radio equipment uh, into conformity. So All right, I think we had a uh, lot of uh, communication there on the phone line. I'm not sure when it went out. Uh, I'm hoping that it wasn't uh, too long ago. Uh, but if you have any questions on the previous slides, um, just send in your questions. I'm going to pick it up from here. And I hope I didn't lose you guys on the last slide. Uh, the CE marking uh, definitely needs to be permanently mounted on the device. Uh, and it needs to be affixed onto the device before it is sold in Europe. Uh, the CE mark needs to be at least uh, 5 millimeters in height. It can be lower depending on the size of the EUT, but it needs to be visible and legitimate. Uh, CE mark, the CE marking shall be followed by the ident identification of the notified body if the conformity assessment procedures were set out in Annex 4 as applied. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So here's some uh, uh, examples of the CE marking. Uh, some right ways to do it and some wrong ways to do it. And I've seen it done uh, all of these ways. So the first two that we have uh, are, are the wrong way to do it. So the CE mark and the number of the notified body needs to be at the same height. And it needs to follow immediately after the CE mark. So the correct way to do it is the uh, last one there, where the CE mark uh, and the notified body number are the same height, and the notified body number follows immediately after the CE mark. Now, there has been a question, can the CE mark and the notified body 
be placed vertically. Uh, so let's say you had a really small label, or the label dictated that uh, images be set vertical. Uh, can the C mark and notify body be placed vertically on the label? And the question is, uh, it should not be. Uh, the radio equipment directive clearly states that it needs to be as shown uh, in this slide here. So now we come to conformity assessment procedures. Uh, there's three annexes that the radio equipment directive deals with. Annex 2, which is referred to as Module A, is the internal production control. And this is Annex 2 is where the uh, manufacturer declares on their own that they meet all the requirements after they test it. And they issue a declaration of conformity saying, we did all the testing, and it meets all the requirements, and the manufacturer signs off on it. Annex 3, uh, which refer, refer to modules B and C, is the notified body opinion that you everybody's used to, uh, where you go to for no, go to a notified body under the, uh, that's been accredited under the radio equipment directive to get a uh, EU type examination report uh, saying that you met all the requirements of the directive and that by you meet uh, all the requirements. Annex four, which refers to module H, is whereby uh, it's a little bit more in depth then Annex 3, uh, whereby a notified body uh, looks at uh, the, the manufacturing process, the quality control, the quality uh, procedures that a manufacturer use, and they do yearly audits or uh, yearly audits or, uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, so that there's full confidence that the, uh, the manufacturer is uh, producing a product that meets all the requirements. So a notified body not only reviews your application, but also the surveillance on your production uh, on a yearly basis or on a regular interval uh, to make sure that you produce the product you said you would. So Annex 2 is, uh, as I mentioned, the um, the easy one where the manufacturer doesn't have to go to a notified body because you used all harmonized standards uh, and you just declare on your own that you meet the requirements of the radio equipment directive. Uh, you draw up a declaration of conformity, uh, you put the CE mark on your device and then you're off and running uh, to sell your product. Modules B and C under Annex 3 is the, um, uh, is the EU type examination. So basically, uh, you send all your reports, application, your te technical construction file to a notified body that's being assessed under the Radio Equipment Directive, and that uh, notified body will go through the paperwork to make sure that you do meet all the requirements of the Radio Equipment Directive. If you do, you'll be uh, issued a EU type examination report. And um, after that, you put the CE mark on the label and uh, you're off to the races again. So this is just a continuation of Annex 3. Uh, you have to make sure that you do uh, you control your manufacturing so that the uh, same product that you gave uh, to the notified body is what's being reproduced. And you put the CE mark, uh, the de declaration of conformity, uh, and you're good to go. The only difference between the RNTT directive and the new radio equipment directive is in the past when you got a notified body opinion, a positive one at least, you put the notified body number next to the CE mark. Now, under the radio equipment directive, if you had your assessment under Annex 3, modules B and C, you do not put the notified body number. So even though a notified body has been involved, your label does not get a notified body number. So as I mentioned, Annex 4 is the conformity based on full quality assurance. And this is where the manufacturer, they have a manufacturing plant, they say that they uh, have quality procedures in place and 
a notified body goes out on a regular basis to make sure that you do uh, say what you do and you produce a product, uh, a final product, a radio product uh, that complies with all the requirements of the radio equipment directive. So the notified body is involved with the, the quality system, the manufacturing aspect of it, and the notified body uh, performs surveillance on those two items. So once that's completed, uh, the manufacturer is able to put the CE mark and the, uh, draw up the European Union Declaration of Conformity. Now, if you do get assessed on the under module H, uh, you do put the, no, the number of the notified body next to the CE mark. So only under module H will you put the notified body number next to the CE mark. As you can see, module H is a little bit more uh, <coughs> uh, a little bit more cumbersome than the modules B and C because you do have to uh, have a contract, uh, a long-lasting contract with a notified body so that they can do surveillance on a uh, regular interval. So I've uh, summarized uh, the last couple of slides. Uh, if you have a radio equipment device and you perform testing to uh, uh, the safety aspects of 3.1a, the E and C aspects of 3.1b, uh, and the radio aspects under 3.2 and 3.3, uh, if everything's harmonized, you can do, you can go the standard module A route where the manufacturer declares on their own that they meet the requirements. You may choose to uh, use a notified body uh, at your own discretion. Uh, even if you uh, use fully harmonized standards, and sometimes some manufacturers do that uh, because it just gives them a warm and fuzzy feeling that you know they've done everything according to uh, what what is required. Now, if you do not use harmonized standards for your radio uh, testing or it's not fully applied, then it is mandated that you use the notified body. So Annex Three or Annex Four has to be used. Uh, before the manufacturer is able to put the CE mark and place on the market. So I have a quick example of a, a product that needs to be sold in Europe. It's basically a 2.4 gigas access point. So the essential requirement uh, under the radio equipment directive was 3.1a, which was safety. Uh, it's either the safety of a human person, an animal, or property. So a 2.4 gigahertz access point uh, is usually uh, assessed uh, under EN 60950, which is a safety standard, uh, which basically uh, you test the product to make sure that it's you know, safe uh, for a person to use uh, in their home or where the, wherever they want to uh, use their 2.4 access point. Uh, a typical access point uh, uh, is placed on a, a desk or ceiling somewhere where it's away from human persons or animals and typically RF exposure testing is not required. But if it was a device that uh, came close to a human person within 20 centimeters, uh, you may also have to do RF exposure testing. Uh, 3.1b was the uh, EMC aspect of it, and for a 2.4 gigahertz access point, the most appropriate EMC radio standards will be 30149-1 and 30149-17. <coughs> Excuse me. 3.2 was the efficient use of the radio spectrum, and the most commonly used standard is EN30328. So if you had a 2.4 access point, you take it to a test lab, an accredited test lab, and you'll have it assessed against those uh, standards there. Then as the manufacturer, you have a choice on which conformity assessment to use. 
if everything's harmonized, all the standards you used and all the standards that I previously listed are all harmonized, uh, then the manufacturer can use Annex 2, which was the self-declaration and easiest route to go. Uh, you just declare, uh, put the CE mark on your, on your device, draw uh, offer a declaration of conformity, list those standards that you tested to, and you declare on your own that you meet all the requirements. You may also choose to use Annex 3 or 4 if you so desire, even though you have used harmonized standards. But then you have to consult with the notified body, uh, and you have to make sure that that notified body has been uh, listed in the NANDO, which is a list of all the notified bodies that have been assessed that are capable of issuing a EU type examination report uh, under the Radio Equipment Directive. And then you need to keep a record of all the documentation that's relevant for the product, and you have to make sure that they are continuously updated on a need-by-need uh, -need basis. And as I mentioned, you put the CE mark, the declaration of conformity, and make sure that all the the the, uh, the wording in those documents are in a language that the member state supports, and make sure that the label has some sort of identifying information so that uh, somebody uh, so that market authorities can not only identify who the manufacturer was, but they can also locate um, uh, them easily, and then the manufacturer also as a way to go back and figure out where where it was uh, made, uh, what dates they were made, and uh, in what batches uh, were these made, so they can easily go back and recall the products if needed. Uh, before you sell to the member state, you make sure that the, the frequencies that you want to operate are supported by that member state. You can go to that website that I listed previously, or you can rely on uh, uh, accurate information that someone provides to you. you. might have a representative in Europe that you can rely on, but it, you need to make sure that uh, your device is allowed to operate <coughs> in those countries. Now, previously I had mentioned that the alert mark next to the CE label was going away, but um, there will be a mandate to put the alert mark on the packaging or the user manual if there are some restrictions on use on a particular member uh, member state. Uh, so those are still being worked on, so it will be a alert mark uh, on the packaging or the user manual, and it will also have a table identifying which countries in the European Union have these restrictions on. And uh, surveillance is a big one that uh, the Radio Equipment Directive emphasizes on. A lot of the changes under the Radio Equipment Directive had to do with tracking down non-complying equipment. Uh, so they made it easier for surveillance authorities in each of the member states to identify the equipment, uh, track down the manufacturer, and there's a, a way for the manufacturer to pinpoint to a specific batch of uh, non-conforming devices. Uh, if there are non-conforming uh, devices, the, the manufacturer, again, is the responsible party, and they shall be responsible for bearing all expenses. Uh, for one, uh, uh, having the product tested, and two, for taking any actions required to bring that device back into conformity. <coughs> Excuse me. Here I've used it, uh, listed some useful links that might be helpful to you. One is the Radio Equipment Directive, uh, and here you'll uh, find the, uh, the directive information on the directive itself. It's a good uh, bedtime read. The next one is the, uh, the Blue Guide which is basically a uh, how-to guide uh, for manufacturers and other interested parties on how to meet the requirements of the RED. It uh, clarifies some, uh, uh, some things that might be ambiguous to the manufacturers till goes into detail about what needs to be done to take a product into Europe, how to put the CE mark, 
what are the dimensions, and it gives all the stuff that I covered in the uh, in the uh, slides. It's basically a, um, uh, a easier read uh, than reading the the red itself. Uh, the third link I have is the EU official journal. Right now, it's still under links to the RNTP directive. Uh, there are no published uh, harmonized standards under the radio equipment directive, and we're hoping that those will be published before the 2017 deadline. I think we're not going to have any uh, harmonized standards by the by June 2016 but they will have, obviously have to have it by 2017. So that was the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to see um, what are the questions that I received. Uh, so just give me a minute. So that does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. Tomorrow we will send an archived copy um, of the file. And now we will answer questions. If you have a question, please type it in the questions area of your control panel. For questions we can easily address now, we will read the question aloud and then give an answer. Okay, I have a question about the alert symbol next to the C mark. And uh, the alert symbol will not be required um, to be on the C. But how, however, it may need to be on the packaging or the user manual as appropriate. Uh, <clears throat> there's another question about uh, the notified body number. So if you perform conformity assessment, under more Annex 3 modules B and C, where you take your product, your um, application to a notified body and have it assessed under module B and C, even though the notified body has been involved, you will not put the notified body number on your CE uh, label. The only time you will have the notified body number on the label is uh, when you have your device assessed under Annex 4, Module H. That is the only time uh, <clears throat> you would need to put the notified body number. So there is a question if uh, a product was tested under 300.328 version 181, do we have to retest according to version 191? Now, I believe 191 was introduced to uh, <clears throat> take care of an issue they had with a particular requirement for a frequency hopping device. Uh, so if your device uh, was, let's say, a access point, then obviously 191 because a access point is not tested as a frequency hopping device. But again, <clears throat> you would need to figure out if there was any changes under 191 that affected your device. And if it does, then you go back and we have it retested. If nothing changed in 1 and 181 where it affects your device, uh, I have another question. Does RFID equipment fall? Uh, usually, RFID devices operate in 13.56 megahertz, 900 megahertz, 2.45, you have 135 kilohertz RFID devices. All of those are transmitters, uh, and they will be, uh, they will fall under the scope of the red. <clears throat> uh, 
I have another question. We have a wireless fitness watch. Do we need to place a CE mark on such a small device? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, I've seen many watches. Uh, there's plenty of space in the back uh, that you should be able to put the CE mark. Now, the minimum height was five millimeters, uh, but uh, depending on the size, uh, you may be able to justify using a smaller font. So there's another question, uh, is there are modules approved under the radio equipment directive? So Europe never had the same concept of a module as does North America, where in North America you can certify a module and once that's integrated into a host, you do not have to, um, uh, you do not have to go back and redo the wireless testing unless you change something on the radio side. In Europe it's a little bit different. Uh, you still can have a module. Uh, it can be tested as a module, but when it when it gets integrated into a host, then you will, might have to go back and re redo the uh, radiated spurious emissions and the radiated spur, uh, receiver spurs, uh, as well as the uh, the digital emissions, which is basically uh, 30149 for most products. Uh, so Europe does not have the formal uh, module approval process, but there's, you can still do most of the testing on the module, and then once it gets integrated, uh, you will have to go back and uh, redo the spurious emissions. So there's a question, is, is there a place where it's easy to track updates to common harmonized standards? Yeah, uh, yes, there is. Uh, under the radio equipment directive, the official journal, which is the, the, the second link I gave you in the presentation slides, that will take you uh, to the official journal where all the harmonized standards are listed under the radio equipment directive. And you can clearly see uh, the standards and the versions that are harmonized and uh, you can keep a track of that and once new uh, versions of the standards are uh, harmonized they'll be placed into that uh, list so you can easily uh, identify when things happen like that. Now there's no such um, official journal for the radio equipment directive right yet, uh, right now, but uh, that's in the works and we should see that uh, before the 2017 deadline. Thank you, Dusmantha. So if you do have any additional unanswered questions, feel free to contact us via phone or email. Tomorrow we will send a follow-up email that will include a link to the presentation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us today.